but you just go and yeah. if you use Cloud9, you just put your they give you credit kind of like works like an ice. Oh, yeah. okay. Oh, it's like an online. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's um, um, yes, but, yes, but, but, but you know, I was trying to get started. Oh, okay. That's my first like. Okay. I mean, 1010 is Excel, but I guess it's yeah. just like actually yeah. more. Yeah, it's like actually a process. Yeah. 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 I think so. Is that what no, Whatever is the very first business class you take for CIS. Excel. I, I, don't think I, have to do I think all of this is so dangerous. Yeah. Okay, I, I don't know what the exact number is. The Excel one. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was like really interesting. Uh, yeah. Okay. I even thought that was, that wasn't even like a grade class, grade class, right? Like credit, not credit. Mm -hmm. I think it just depends on the teacher. Right. Mine was credit, no credit. Mm -hmm. It's just one credit, no credit as well. And mine is really Mm -hmm. If anything, it's on syllabus. So. I really forgot about that class. You still put that uh, in your sack? Yeah, mm -hmm. my jacket. Green and gold. Yeah. You should come to the, the green and gold block party. It's I have one house on you, and it's up to two, right? Ten to one. I will compete to the three. Excuse me. Not one. My friend told me about skip work. Skip work. Skip work. Yeah, me and Zay work, work, work very hard for that. Yeah. yeah. I do. But my office is doing it. Do you guys have to work too? Yeah. Just table. Oh, you did it. The whole thing. I'm going to check it But the basketball game is at what? Four? Three. Three? I can still make that. Really? <laughs> I see you. It's called Kenneth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yes. It's very close to the deployment site. You know, you know, it's great. Everything's on the left. The assignments are on the left. It's getting close to the next as well. And what is on? You It's not going to be scary. Yes. It's great. I have it. I use Gizmo. So, I love you. You have a 530? Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's just funny. Like, yeah, it's pretty There's dumb. so many like, classes, like, you know, five and six, whatever schedule. I feel like, and, like, I'm a, well, like just choosing, yeah, I still know. Like, it's just funny. You know, I respect it. It's so unintentional. It's just funny how it's like, I'm like, what's the point? Like, get clone, get clone, get clone, get clone, get clone, she works at Change Education. Uh, uh, she'll bring in her own contract for documents. Why is she teaching? Huh? Anything. She's like, she's teaching me like basically contract law and work. She said she was still in school. She like that. I wish I could have it immediate. Go make it so I can write it in the moment. I like the homework is really I feel like this is a conversation I have with people upstairs for like cybersecurity people. So they're all on the quizzes, but it's a good thing. And it's all the midterms are going to be online. 
the final is, is also online and like the mid there's a presentation final, which is again a group of four people and you can present a case. Oh, yeah. US versus X or and then you have to say like why they're wrong or something. Yeah, or you what laws are being like in order. Yeah, what the and you don't have to present it, you just turn it in and get school credit. It's a better world than if you want extra credit, you present it. Really? Yeah. She mentioned something about it, but I was distracted because I FaceTimed Kenneth. I was like, Kenneth, we're in the same class. Oh, yeah. And then she was talking about that. <laughs> I had an old room at the Long Pop semester with another person, and I hated it because it was so much. So I. Like, I never thought I would, like, actually use the app drop. Because you have to, like, um, RSVP to try to participate in class. So, for example, if this week started, I would have to email him the week before. And whoever he sees on the email pop up first um, gets to participate. So it's like a free-for-all. Fast like participation rate. Oh, so stupid. I mean, I can't think of any other people, but that's why I like Well, we're going to start today. Um, so just keep talking amongst yourselves. We see that none of this is working yet, so I have to work yeah. with it and it so I'll, I'll interrupt. I think we're gonna download it up. What's it called? Ping? Did it, did you understand it? Download it? Yeah. Yeah, I tried downloading it and it took me to like download. And there was no like button to download it. Uh, maybe you have to like code it or something. Oh, great. I'm not sure. Maybe it's a CIS measure too. That's the one I pointed out the last year. So this is going to be a challenging, a challenging 12 months when we are so realistic enough. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I actually didn't know that. That's the biggest. Uh, yeah. Lots of our Amazon. Yeah. 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 Amazon. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah. Oh, there's an American. So, great. Okay, so Tesla yeah, dropped 12% yeah. today. Yeah, that's correct. What about, I wonder what the, the general index did today? shareholder meeting. Um, luckily, these are live stream. Um, and I think it will help frame kind of what this class is about. So I want to, you know, kind of have Ellen and us talk a little bit about what 
information systems mean inside of his company. Now, when Elon talks about information systems, he's not talking about full self-driving. He's not talking about um, Starlink, and he's not talking about um, what makes Tesla really distinctive, you know, the AI features. He's really talking about the glue that holds the company together as a series of digital services that facilitate management and that make his job possible. Does that make sense? And so also I want you to put uh, some context. And I have this, this link linked inside of our Google Doc. This is what the shareholder meeting um, looks like. And we're going to turn the mic down a little bit. Uh, basically, and let me ask you guys a few questions. And feel free to um, say, speak a little bit. When you guys, if you were in Elon Musk's position and you're meeting with all the people who own Tesla, he owns about 12% of Tesla, and you know, BlackRock, Vanguard, you know, the big, the big equity companies really own the vast majority of the rest of it. But you have these shareholders here. What's going on here? Like, what kind of a message does Elon Musk have to communicate during a shareholder meeting? That they're successful? Yep, that things are going well, namely under him, correct? Yep. Uh, not everything has gone to total shit. <laughs> Okay, yeah, and then what else? Like, if you were Elon Musk, what are you trying to do during the shareholder meeting? Get more funding for a future project. Okay, get more stock to be bought, correct? That's a great answer. Probably communicate that their money is in safe hands and that they have put their money into the right thing. Now, if, if they left the meeting feeling unconfident or or abused or unwelcome, what might happen to the share price? It decrease. Could it decrease violently? Yeah. I mean, you guys are, see, I don't I don't underestimate students. You know what I come in? You know, I don't follow uh, Tesla stock, but I mean, I know students too. Look at that violent disruption right there. It's really, what do you think is happening? Why is that going down like that? People are losing their faith in Tesla. Yeah, very interesting. Um, you guys, yeah, go ahead. Didn't want to interrupt you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just saying because you bought ads in that one too. I would not know it. Okay, you guys. On what metric? It's almost about ready. No, it's been a huge success. I know there are people out there that love to drag him through the mud for political reasons, but X is ready to go public again, like the equity you feel. The equity owners are rated. So I don't know. I don't I agree with that. Um, but um, let me say this. During this class, you guys are going to do some experiments. And you're going to demonstrate why prices go up and why they go down. Does that make sense? There's a causal inference. Can you guys say causal inference? Causal inference. Causal inference. Right. You can say it. You can, you can do it. Um, causal inference are really the conditions that exist that lead up to events, such as prices going like this. Now, I think that we tend to say sell off. Does that make sense? People are selling off. Typically, when people are selling, prices are going up. This is interesting. You guys are actually going to prove this. The reason why is because people don't sell at a discount. Does that make sense? They sell high. And so when you have a large volume of people selling, they tend to ask for higher prices. Is that, it's like if you have a house, you want to ask for it high. But what's happening is that um, there's a tremendous amount of people who want to buy into this. And the number of orders that are coming in at extremely low prices gets to be so large that you can't sell off at a high price. The only way you can sell is at a discount. And we're not talking about you guys. Does that, anybody own Tesla out there? It's a good, good thing to own. Does that make sense? You got to put up with the, the dings. Does that make sense? Like my parents hate Elon Musk. Does that make sense? Yeah. They're like Democrats. You know, they hate, they hate the, they hate the whole thing. Um, and uh, so you have to live through bumpiness. You know, there are people who don't believe. 
you know, I don't need to believe, I'm not a believer, you know, so I'm not very political, you know, um, but I'm more of an exploitation person, just so you know, yeah, like, if there's an opportunity there, I, I'm morally obligated to take advantage of it, yeah, and maybe you are too, but probably on days like today, you really don't want to sell on a day like today, but if you are a hedge fund person, you may need to create liquidity. You may need to sell something off in order to move money out of elsewhere. Somebody has a reason. And frankly, one person selling off half a billion can create moments like this. But really what you have is very little selling. And actually what you have is a lot of buying. And the buyers have forced the sellers down. The day traders, the hedge funds, they're the ones who cause price to move. Does that make sense? Without people actively participating in the market throughout the day and on a daily basis, there is no price. Does that make sense? So it's traders, right? It's Wall Street that are putting our, putting us uh, in that position. Very interesting. Have you have you guys watched uh, Dumb Money? Yes. The GameStop versus hedge fund guys. I think that would be good for everybody to watch that. Have you guys watched Dumb Money? On <clears throat> It, that, that might be good for everybody. Would you recommend it to everybody? Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you go and watch that? Dumb Money is now on Netflix. You guys have Netflix? Netflix went through a period where a lot of people were canceling. How about you guys? Does everybody have Netflix? It's good to, there, there's, there's you know, reasons to have it, reasons to not have it. So what Elon needs to do is to preclude conditions like this. And so when you're thinking about the annual shareholder meeting, you know, he's really got to make some impact in some ways. Somebody who was really thinking like a trader a minute ago where they said, really, he needs to be able to sell that stock in order to raise money. Who said that? Somebody over here. You have to take credit for that. That's really brainy. That's the purpose of a securities market is to have a constant money raising environment. And for example, Elon or somebody in his position wants to go to a pension fund and say, hey, I want you to buy a billion dollars of Tesla, and I will give you a discount on it if we can get a billion dollars of your buy-in today. And frankly, um, I know we're looking at a crash or you know, the media is saying, oh, weak guidance. That's not necessarily true at all. Does that make sense? Again, media is not your friend. Media is not here to help you. Media is owned by Citigroup. J.P. Morgan, does that make sense? The big banks own media. Be very clear about that. So these aren't honest people. These are people who have to deliver <laughs> results, and they own big chunks of the government. Yeah? So you need to be very suspicious of what's going on in the media. Does that make sense? I'm sorry, did you have your hand up? Yeah. How can you tell the company is doing a split stock? Because they don't go up, like, like you know, so it's going up and it's going up. You mean the split? They're really doubling the number of yeah. shares available. Oh, whether they. That's a great. Um, you know, I don't know if it, it may indicate that here. There's no standard icon, but there's probably a news event that would say, you know, like Apple split. Yeah. But really, when you see a big drop like this, and I don't mean to criticize you, like you're welcome, like your opinion is respected here. Um, but when you have a big drop like this, really what you have are you have Elon's bankers, either in Silicon Valley, in Chicago, or in New York, going to a big pension fund and saying, we need to raise like $3 billion. Does that make sense? How much stock can we sell you? And if you're a smart money manager, you're going to say, I will, uh, I will do a quarter of that today at a, at a five percent discount. And if you can make that kind of volume, I'll come back and we can do another five percent at an eight percent discount. Does that make sense? So that's the way, that's the reason why you have prices. All this is is just the, the most recent settled price. Does that make sense? That's why there's a little bit of a spiritual energy to finance and deal making because the the Tesla people want to get buying. But when you have a large accumulate, when you have a very bearish, you know, a crash, it's really because there's a ton of buying orders. So really what it represents is something very bullish, where somebody wanted to buy up a big chunk of it. 
Does that does that sound odd? A lot of people are like, oh my gosh, it crashed. But the truth of it is, is people expect that there to be very significant market-wide crashes, A, in February, and then certainly in the short term. They see this kind of um, holiday boom as a very short-term um, phenomenon. Here, let's go one year, five year. Yeah, this kind of great Santa rally, people expect for things to crash and crash hard. So here, so frankly, um, do people consider Tesla a magnificent seven? I, I'm not an equity guy. Does that make sense? So I'm happy to be corrected when it comes to, you know, uh, but really when Tesla takes a big header like that, you can expect other companies to begin to do the same. What Tesla has to do on a day-to-day -day basis is sell stock. Does that make sense? To keep a healthy amount of money coming in. And if you are Elon Musk investment bankers, that's exactly what you're doing. You said, Elon, I was able to raise X dollars for you this month via equity sales. Does that make sense? So even though we see it as a crash, it actually means that somebody <laughs> is buying. But they want it discounted. So that means they're buying a lot of it, which is actually a big endorsement. So I appreciate that. So back to the shareholder. Um, Elon's got to get out of here, and he's got to sell. Does that make sense? And I get that there's political people who don't like him, but this is a business school. You all are meant to, you know, this is somebody practicing business. He is actively trying to court investors. Also, he is trying very hard to court the best talent. So when you see um, a Tesla events such as this, he's actually trying hard to communicate to the best AI developers on planet Earth that Tesla is the place to be and that he is a viable leader. So that's all fine. So I just wanted to set the stage, and then I wanted to move the needle a bit forward. Again, I apologize for not agreeing with you. I, I, uh, your point is well taken. All right. I want to be sort of realistic about it. Um, the test is not immune. It should be said that. Um, so just watch your head. I'll these comments. Um, that the, the that interest rates make a, a very big have a very big effect on the affordability of cars. So the vast majority of people buy cars based on the monthly payment. So it's like how much money, how much is the monthly payment? Um, and and it's, it's not a it's not a question of, of, of value of money. It's just do they actually have enough money? Can they afford it? Um, so if, now, if you were Elon Musk, or rather, I'm sorry, let's say you guys are shareholders. You each own a couple million in Tesla, let's say all of you. And you were looking at a Fed funds environment from a year ago, wouldn't the rates that were going up be of concern for car makers? Wouldn't that be a point of concern for you guys? You're like, well, how am I supposed unit volume sales, how am I supposed to get stock price rise in a year where lending is becoming harder, where it's harder to get a car loan? Has anybody bought a car lately? You know, you're paying you're paying a lot more for car loans right now. It's a bad year for doing a new, a new car loan. You know, you have to bring more cash to the table, your credit has to be better. You know, it's luckily their cars are giving off a lot of incentives, so you know it ends up washing. But if you are friendly with Elon, you are nervous that he can't make unit sales in a year where the Fed is going to keep rate, raising interest rates a year ago. And there was many more interest rate uh, rises on the table. So it's moderated a little bit. So for the vast majority of people, just can they afford to pay the payment? As the interest rates increase um, and, and credit tightens, um, like it's safe to say that the, you know, these Various banks that um, have died are probably uh, somewhat distracted um, from handing out order loans. Yeah. So, you know, I'm used to listening to these talks. So, do you realize the first day of class, I was talking macroeconomic finance. I was spending half the class talking about our biggest trade partner. I spent half the class talking about China and saying, what is China doing? How will China? impact the discipline of information systems. 
And for many of you, you may be like, well, wait a second, this is not an international relations class, but China's involvement with us, that has defined A, the kind of business that we do, and then B, the kind of information systems that we make. Does that make sense? Because frankly, 75% of what we do, i.e. manufacture, it's done overseas. It's done by somebody else. So you guys are in a different climate because that's going to shift. So I began the first day saying that the kind of information systems that we build, it has everything to do with the position that we find ourselves in. And you can see how I'm doing the same thing. It's like in a way, it's the cemetery increasing their order of portfolio is not the first thing on their mind. Um, so this is going to be a challenging, I say challenging 12 months. I want to be sort of realistic about it. Um, the test is not immune uh, to uh, the global economic environment. Um, so if you guys know that there's kind of an 800 pound gorilla in the room that's creating fear, what do you guys do as a manager? Do you A, deny it? Do you B, <laughs> kind of lie about it a little bit? Say, oh, the Fed's going to stop raising rates tomorrow. B, or C, you kind of hit it nail on the head and say, I get it, this is a scary environment. We don't know where rates are going. They're going to keep on going up. Does that make sense? What do you do as a manager? Well, what does Elon Musk do? Is he the world's second richest man? I forget. Is he at the top? Is he like two or something? Yeah. Uh, there's the LVMH people. Really smart. Um, what he's doing is he's trying to get to the critical threats to the business model right now. Can be very upfront about it. How does that strike you? It's kind of radical honesty. Is being radically honest good for business? It's kind of a big question. Well, if you're a CEO, you, you kind of have to, and, and you're kind of covering your tail a little bit by saying this is a real threat to what we're doing. Now, you might be asking, hey, Mr. Fund, that's great, but why are you talking about that in an information systems class? Well, we're getting to that. We're building up to that. But we're kind of creating a, a landscape. We're creating a situation, and then we're going to talk about the response. What are we going to do tactically to live within a more expensive, a rate rising environment, a hostile China environment, a place where we can't source microchips consistently? That's our context, right? I expect things to be just at a macroeconomic level um, difficult for at least the next 12 months. Um, like Tesla will get through it and will do well, and I think we'll see a lot of companies actually uh, go back up. Um, so I, I, I want to make sure that this is not just the good news break. It's important to, to understand that uh, no company is immune to the macro macroeconomic environment. But that said, the, the, it, it won't be darkness uh, forever. I expect probably a year of difficulty uh, globally well, for everyone. Um, and then my, my best guess is that the global economy turns around uh, in roughly 12 months. Um, and, and then Tesla will be in, in an extremely good position. So anyone who is a long term investor, I think, will do extremely well. So again, this is how a CEO of this caliber communicates with investors of their magnitude. Be extremely honest, but then provide some, don't take their soul away. Say, admit to stuff, but then talk about how you've got a plan. We're gonna, we're gonna succeed in this environment. Does that make sense? Yep. So, this is what I really want to show you. Coming up. So, he paints the picture. He talks about the sustainable economy. He talks about the rate environment. He talks about the competitive pressures. He talks about the fact that a lot of people in his industry are going to go bankrupt. Does that make sense? He sets the stage. Then what's the first thing he does in order to build up your confidence? Here it comes. And um, here I want to uh, give a, a big shout out to the Tesla in, uh, in, internal software. Uh, team. So this, um, First thing he does is he talks about CIS. These are all the operating systems that they depend upon to make S Tesla go. It, it, it's actually a, a really big deal. 
that uh, Tesla has such a powerful internal software team. Um, I mean, that, that, that software team is responsible for handling the entire uh, customer experience from, from buying the car, delivering the car, um, operating the factories, um, service and support. Uh, we internally wrote all the insurance and financial software. Um, the, it's for the supply chain, you know, logistics stuff, the data centers, the infrastructure, um, and the analytics and insight. This is all uh, internally within Tesla software. I think there's there almost no companies in the world who do this. Uh, so why, in, of all the interesting things that Elon Musk can talk about, you know, uh, boring to you know, the boring, you know, boring to the center of the Earth and Starlink and SpaceX and solar power. Why is he choosing this to talk about? And talk about it first and lead with this, with this attribute. Well, he's trying to create a message that this company is incredibly cohesive, that there is custom built world class <laughs> information systems at every stage of the manufacturing and customer experience. The best CEO in the world who can charge the greatest amount for his stock price, it's going to be very clear that the internal operating system in Tesla is a world-class efficiency, and that they are trying hard to run Tesla like a technology company, and that it is a cutting-edge investment. Does that make sense? So I, I wanted to bring this out here because this is what you guys are studying with me this term, which is, you know, what's the relevance of, of information systems? What kind of competitive advantage does that give us? What are the world's greatest companies do vis-a-vis -vis information systems? And so I want to use this little, I want to use Elon's slide um, before moving on as a way to demonstrate some of the systems that we're going to look at. Um, so today we're going to do data centers and infrastructure. We're actually going to get you guys into a cloud. We're going to make a cloud for you guys. We're going to use this cloud for a number of months because really, uh, doing uh, analytics and doing machine learning is very cloud intensive. I love laptops, and you guys are the apogee of cool and sexy laptops. You included. That's a hell of a laptop. It's like a, a super laptop. Does that make sense? I'm like, is that the biggest laptop I've seen today? Yeah, it is. I mean, you guys are like the Windows people. They're always bringing more iron to the table. Um, but it's going to be interesting for you guys to see how much computing power you guys can drive down or bring down that's actually a couple states away. So we're going to go over clouds. We're going to do a lot of analytics. Now, have you guys gone through the process of buying a car? Have you priced that car? Have you gone, tell, me about, tell me about a car website that you've gone to lately. Uh, very good. Very good. What did you think? Um, out of my price range, yes. Well, CarMax is a good one because there's a lot of stuff there, but maybe it's it's still too high. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you're a college kid. Like you talk like a socialist right now, but just give it a few months. Does that make sense? Like give it a few months. You're going to be in the six figures soon enough. Does that make sense? You probably need something. Now, what he's saying is that. You probably want to buy something right now, right? But maybe in a few months, it's going to get, your, your affordance is going to go up. You, get, you need a car right now? Uh, I've been needing a car for two years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, cars are a very emergency thing. Like, suddenly you need it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I got a used recently. Interest rates are high, really high. Right now. What color is your Jeep? Black. My girls are 12 and 13, and they want a white and a pink Jeep. That's their car. You know, I got a Gladiator Jeep 2021. I had excellent credit, and since I owned it, it was my first um, car, like officially under my name, I got a co-signer. And despite that, the interest rate, like both excellent credit, interest rate 2. Point, no, 6.6. That's not, that's not bad. That's, that's, that's a pretty good yeah. yeah. so, <laughs> My dad, he has two really other cars, and both of those, one is a 1.5% and the other one is 1.2%. Yeah. You probably bought it back in 2012. Yeah. Six, is, six is a lot. Six, six is a lot. Market average. Well, yeah, no, I think right now, she's, 
she's partly, when did he write those loans? And he might have written those loans before the Fed began the hiking process, where you add in an additional four BPS, right? That, that's just one year of hiking. Yeah, one girl was one year ago, and the other was three years ago. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's what she said. Yeah. You know, I actually had a, a young guy, and I appreciate you talking. I, I hope we don't spark too much. But I had a young guy who was sitting here by you, and I was like, I had the same conversation where I was like, what car are you looking at? And he goes, 2004 Chevy Cutlass or some old bucket. <laughs> like what he does is he scans around for this car, and then he rebuilds this particular Chevy. Does that make sense? And so um, that's very Southern California, frankly. You know, like buying a bucket, transforming it. I mean... Yeah, that's what we dream about. Um, so tell me about the Jeep website. You like the Jeep. How much time do you feel like you went through researching and pricing it? Do you spend a lot of time on their website? Yes, I, like, it was over six months. And I ended up getting it because it was, what's it called? It just popped up. It had just gone back to sale because it's a manual car. So they returned it. And that's why I ended up being it because it was severely discounted compared to all the same ones, but that was automatic. It's really smart. But it's a very versatile car. Mm -hmm. Now, so what she's talking about is customer experience. You know, so yes, it's this very visual, lots of photographs, but this is just one piece of the customer experience. So did you go to the Jeep dealer or did you do more of a used buy? Did you buy it? Uh, I bought it used. Okay. Um, did you get it at Jeep or did you get it somewhere else? I looked at the Jeep dealership. They didn't have what I was looking. The Jeep I saw on display on the dealership next to it. It was Audi. Audi dealership was promoting it. Yeah. Yeah. Your heart, yours is kind of gladiator is kind of a high end car. This is clearly their flagship. This is literally what she she bought, right? Um. So. Uh, the customer experience for the Tesla is almost kind of a duh, it's kind of a no duh experience at this point. Like there's so many incentives. If you walk in there, I did this last Christmas and I was in the same level position where I was like, I had this car, I gotta get a new car, it's just time to do it, let's just do it. And um, it just ended up being so convenient. I think within 10 minutes, they basically had me ready to buy the so the only thought process I have is that, and you were looking at CarMax, right? Mm -hmm. Have you been to a CarMax? Yes. Like you go there in person. They have all these digital systems that get you ready to purchase. Like I went there to sell a truck and they had me cutting a check like within a few minutes. <laughs> like they had it priced. No, no, they were cutting a check to me in a few minutes. You know, I was selling it to them. And they were so organized and I realized as a customer, am I going to put up with a lot of waiting? Am I going to put up with a lot of indecision? Like, what do I need as a customer? I need to have things almost immediate when I sit down there. Does that make sense? Check this out. What do you think the beginning price point at CarMax is? Like, what do you think their bottom level cars? The cheapest one I saw, I think the price was 13 Okay, so That's, I was going to say 20 the 13 is, okay, that's a lot lower than what I thought. I was kind of like, a lot of students, they're in college forever, right? They're in college for like four years. That feels like a long time. It'd be kind of cool if there was a website that was all about cars that are kind of within the budget of college, students who work. <laughs> yeah? Like, if you said, my budget is 8,000 bucks tops, or my budget is 7,500, Suddenly, you know, it becomes hard to find a vehicle that's cheap. Just putting that out there, yeah? Yeah. Because there is no customer experience for cars that are not on CarMax. What do you have to go through? And now, let me get the pressure off of him. If you guys want to buy a car for 75 price bucks, I'm just putting arbitrary, 7,500, what do you have to do? Very great. Offer. Yeah. <laughs> There's like seven different solutions. Offer up, private seller, well, Craigslist, FB, eBay Motors. There's like 10 different concepts. 
So what is the best solution? Really, it's a, it's a marketplace in chaos. Yeah? So let me, here's my favorite story, Carvana. Carvana is kind of a kind of a creature of the pandemic. So Ernesto Garcia III, he's the son of Ernesto Garcia II. His father was like a cowboy hat wearing used car dealer in rural Arizona. That's where the Garcias are. And so his dad was a real classic. You know, he owned like you know eighth grade education. He had like three or four different used car dealerships around their hometown. And so his dad's a real wheeler dealer. You know, he's like, have you ever like had a movie where there was like a used car dealer? Like he is like used car like guy. And you know, selling cars out in the 100 degree heat, like he's an American classic, you know, like cowboy hat on. So his son, Ernesto, is literally like among the top 100 high school graduates in math. And so he gets a scholarship to uh, Stanford, clears Stanford in like three years. Doogie Hauser's Stanford, and then he goes does more graduate school. So Ernesto is very interesting because he was born and raised in rural Arizona, and he kind of has a Stanford Silicon Valley education. And so his idea was to build a used car dealership with all of the advantages of Silicon Valley, i.e., a software mediated used car dealership, and then. His, his concept was that you bring the car to the person's house, they buy it on an app on their couch. Does that make sense? Now, I get that Carvana has been through, I think, you know, brushes from bankruptcy, et cetera, but I think they're still alive, correct? I admire Carvana because I'm driving down to 10 to visit you guys, and there's a gigantic car vending machine out by Ontario Airport. That was Ernesto's idea. Car vending machine? So let me say this. CarMax, probably the world's biggest used car dealership, a totally assist information systems business. Does that make sense? Um, really able to bridge all of the used cars together. If you're looking for a used car, isn't CarMax the right place to go? Pretty remarkable. Like, it's unavoidable. So imagine a business threatening CarMax and doing things that CarMax is unwilling to do. Does that make sense? The reason why I like this is because um, it's kind of a cool American story where the second generation kind of goes digital and does dad's stuff with a kind of a digital flip, kind of an information systems flip. And so frankly, you know, have you used Carvana? How about, have you checked out Carvana for your car search? How about for the Jeep? Did you look on Carvana? No, I, I was pretty sure I wanted to go directly with the dealer. Yeah, sure. Have a relationship. Yeah. Yeah, perfectly good. They have the same prices, you know. Actually, the financing for Carvana is kind of bad. Honestly, I think they have uh, pretty bad rates. But I think if you were looking for a car during the pandemic, it was inevitable for you to whip out your phone. You couldn't go anywhere. You're on your couch. I bought two, I bought a 75 inch QLED for my kids, and I bought an 82 inch TV for myself. Does that make sense? Yeah. And uh, so I'm sitting on my couch for hours at a time, Zooming with you guys. And then, you know, you find yourself looking at cars on Carvana. Like Carvana became kind of a gold standard for pricing, uh, valuation, and business process. So I think when Elon Musk talks about customer experience, it's really all about, you know, frankly, Carvana defines customer experience. They've kind of rewritten the rules for how you can get a car. Does that make sense? Now let me ask a quick question. You guys know Carvana, you probably know all about it. You probably know all about Tesla. Tesla works the same way. Where it used to be you would order up a Tesla and they would drive it to your door. Nowadays they actually have dealerships. Like they have, they have new dealerships. Um, but they didn't used to have really good dealerships. You would drive down the highway, there would be a flatbed full of Teslas driving one destination to the next. So instead of having dealerships, it really focused on the app as a way to sell. Does that make sense? So I think that's a cool case study where you have CarMax who defines the environment, right? Good old reliable CarMax, who's frankly a digital business. Yeah, who's really a website-driven business. And a digital infrastructure. Then you have Tesla that proposes kind of a, you could buy a Tesla with Bitcoin. 
know, a couple of Bitcoin we could test. And so um, that would be adequate. Um, and then uh, you have Carvana that enters the race as yet another alternative, right? Now let me say this. What is Carvana's valuation today? I think they're at a billion. That's a whole lot of value in not very much time. So a good story, a good story. Really a unicorn, a company that gets to a billion in like three years. It's kind of interesting. So I think when you guys talk about information systems, I think you're really talking about A, um, customer desire. What is a customer really looking for? Can we engineer, can we conform our business to what uh, the audience will tolerate? Let me ask, and, and B, it's all about uh, creating something fresh that you own that is disruptive. Now, let me ask you guys this. Um, you bought your Jeep recently, and I appreciate you volunteering this story. Um, I, um, I'm gonna tell a little story that's not directly related, but then we'll bring it back to this. My uh, daughter is a volleyball player. She's like about 13. And so there's this gigantic warehouse in Rancho where they all love girls play. And so it was raining crazily, and myself and the parents, they make us line up outside of the warehouse, um, and we all have to pay 10 bucks to get inside, but the rain is coming down, and I'm sitting there with all these pissed off parents. And everybody's going on Google, you know, Google Maps to like give ratings to making us wait outside. And I was sitting there, I was talking to this, this woman, and she was like, ah, I can't believe it, I pay so much money here, and they make me sit outside, it's raining, I gotta wait to get inside. And I was like, I know. They should have some way to digitally ticket us and get us to that door at half the time. It's totally unacceptable. They should accept Bitcoin. You know, we should be in there in 10 seconds. We shouldn't be out here in the poor area waiting. And the woman was like, I know. And so um, the truth is, is we got inside about four minutes later. I was really only waiting outside for five minutes. Like they didn't do a bad job. But I was a PO that I had to wait at all. Like if this in an experience, if an experience is not completely sinuous and not completely continuous and just totally fluid, I'm getting that. Does that reflect badly on me? Am I a prima donna? Maybe I think I'm becoming a prima donna. Like if I can't get what I need in 10 seconds, I'm starting to get fidgety. I must be some kind of tweaker. You know what I mean? Like it's a name. Now, if you don't get what you want, you guys, you know, you're putting up with me, so clearly you have you know, character. But imagine how twitchy and fidgety and impatient the American consumer is. Let me ask you this. You guys all know people all over the world. Are the Americans more prima donna? Are the Americans more demanding than people in other parts of the world? Are people in other parts of the world more patient, more humble? Yes. More tolerant of adversity. For, yeah, and you guys would know. You get, you know, people, where do you know people? What, what people do you know? I'm from Mexico. Okay, I know people in Australia, Europe. Uh, my dad was from was from Britain, and my mom was from Mexico. And they're pretty nice people. Yep, and they're nice people. Well, how are the Americans compared to those people? I had a kid from Saudi Arabia recently, and even the Saudis are very. Nice people. Like, if they have a hardship, like, they just wait it out. If we have a hardship, what do we do? Meltdown. Like, have you had to fly in an airline recently? It's kind of, like, scary. Like, when it's time to get off the airline, I'm afraid that people are going to run me over. Like, I'm ready to be, like, in the Empire. You know what I mean? Like, like, I'm ready to, like, you know, defend myself. America has, it's not like we have to be at each other's, it's not like we have to be impatient, but if we get an experience that is inefficient, that is not getting us where we want, that is not customized to our wants, how do we feel about it? Well, we're looking for alternatives. Does that make sense? We're yeah. looking for the world, what do we have? It's kind of like an aristocracy. Yeah, no, you're correct. And also, we're accustomed to people building services that do accommodate our needs. Yeah? We're used to Silicon Valley saying, hey, guess what? We'll drive the new car to your house. You know, Silicon Valley is about removing the friction to you pressing the buy button. Yeah? 
And so let me ask you quickly about this. Is CIS 3100 about startups like Carvana, CarMax? Is it about startups or is it just about the systems? And so I, I've been involved with startups since 2006 when I graduated from Cloud Graduate University. You know, I, I find that I start the conversation talking about clouds and I find that I start the conversation talking about data and analytics and experiences. And then by the end of the conversation, I'm talking about billion dollar companies and I'm talking about companies that are three years old that have overtaken marketplaces and have disrupted and have reached customers where they sit. Does that make sense? So I think the way that this class used to be is that we just talked about accounting and human resource systems. And it used to be a snoozer. But now we're talking about human resource systems and accounting and clouds. And then we're going right to the startup stuff. We're going right to the billionaire stuff, the Ernesto Garcia stuff. And uh, I feel like, is that a legitimate conversation? Like, can we make those leaps of logic? Is that fair? You know, it's an open question in my mind. I think it's kind of like, I think we have to have that conversation, which is if we create a digital system, are we creating new wealth very quickly? Is there a possibility of doing that? And I want to leave that as an open question. Yeah. So that's kind of where we are in this age. Um, now, is it fair for a Cal Poly kid, you know, who's maybe the first generation of college, is that is it fair for that kid to build up new billion dollar digital systems? Should I be implanting visions of grandeur in your head? You know, yet, and, yet again, another question. The, the answer is uh, some of the richest people in the world are Cal Poly graduates. Does that make sense? Look at ESRI. These are founded by people who went here. And also, other people who have the same exact education as yourself are also very important founders. And I'm really thinking about Walmart. Does that make sense? I haven't even told you my Walmart story yet. But you know, Sam Walton would have had the same education as you guys. So I just want to kind of bring that up. I want to reinforce that idea. So I want to motivate you to keep, you know, stick with it. All right, so um, point taken. We create shareholder value by demonstrating our managerial capacity. Elon Musk can, can say that he has control over his firm insofar as he can claim that his information systems are uh, potent, and they're working, and they're custom built for their purpose. And it's very interesting that he would lead the shareholder conference talking about information systems. Nobody's excited about risk and compliance. Nobody's excited about information security. Nobody's excited about health and safety. But when you begin to see these systems in a portfolio, you realize there's an embracing envelope of management. And who is Elon Musk? Well, he's the best of the best, right? Ivy League educated, second richest guy in the world. So I like to draw from his lead here and there. Now this class is not about Elon, so if you don't like Elon, you don't gotta hear about it very much. But what else does he talk about? So he leads with information systems, and then he gets into you know the expansion of factories. You know, he gets into the nitty-gritty of where the company is going. But I thought it was fun. And when I was looking at the shareholder meeting, I was like, oh, I have to tell the kids about this. It's the perfect way to, to frame the class and get kids ready for it. So yeah, very cool. Um, anybody think about working at Tesla when they're finished here? They'll take you. You got to go to Austin, though. You know what I hear about Austin? It's, it's a hood. <laughs> It's a hood with good barbecue. <laughs> I don't know. Like good food sources. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. Um, Elon is uh, is kind of an interesting public figure. He's kind of willing to make himself a public figure. Isn't that strange? It may be the difference between us and him. He is willing to be, you know, made fun of. You know, he's willing to be out there in the middle of media. It's very interesting. 
Yeah. Okay. So pretty cool. All right. So let's do a little exercise. And what I'd like for you to do is to look at aws.amazon.com. And I'd like you to navigate over there. And I'd like to take over on my um, laptop if I can. Yes. And then I'll make a movie about what I uh, talk about here. Anybody need more light? You like my ambience? I have a fancy uh, mouse that I like to use. Do um, you see the mouse that I use? It's like a little pen mouse. I have really, uh, I have carpal tunnel in my wrists. Have you, have you ever gotten carpal tunnel? Repetitive stress injury? As long as I use this, I don't get the injury. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Screen cam, audio, let's go. <clears throat> Perfect. So um, let's get started by getting everybody a clap. And I'm not overstating this. So go ahead, aws.amazon.com. Go ahead and go over there. And then um, normally we would have you sign into the console. And so we want to get everybody an account. So I think you can click on the sign into the console. And then it'll prompt you to get to register for a new account. So we want to create a new AWS account. You want to do that stuff right here? Should we do it together? Yes. Yeah. Um, I was watching a YouTube about a, a neurosurgeon and a physician. She was talking about the uh, the world of stress plays and how determinative stress is upon your health. And I wanted to say something to you guys um, you know, about this class. Um, we're going to do some challenging hands-on things. We're going to build some IT products. But that's going to happen Tuesday and Thursday. We're going to work hard Tuesday and Thursday. And then after that, the workload is going to be quite easy. You don't have to do any of these projects on the weekend. You don't have to do the hard things on your own. You do the hard things with me. Does that make sense? I would prefer to be doing this to, to I prefer to be teaching the content by having you guys experience the systems. Does that make sense? But you're not accountable uh, to do a good job building the system. I think if you just show up to class, you're going to be fine. But you don't have to work on this stuff on the weekend. The work that you do on the weekend is my lab. Can you guys say my lab? My lab. When do you do my lab? Thank you. You do it on the weekend. My lab is like the traditional lecture content, the PhD stuff. Does that make sense? Like my colleagues, they love a good PowerPoint. That's not me. Like my job, I'm a professor in practice. I'm here to get you started to do things. Right? I want to transform your DNA a little bit. I know you can do it, and I just want to have you try it. Tuesday, Thursday is your day to work hard. You're going to work hard in practice, and you're going to celebrate on the weekend. It's as if we have a Gaussian curve where at the bell, in the middle of the curve, is where the greatest amount of effort is going to take place. You're going to have to eat your weeds. Be prepared to put out Tuesday and Thursday. But Friday, just sit at Starbucks and watch your mile. It's, it's the stuff. It's easy stuff. Okay? So I feel like as your leader, I want to say that it's going to be fun, hard work. You're going to get a lot. You're going to get a lot. I'm not going to waste your time. I want to take you on a little adventure. But there won't be any adventure on your own. You're going to do it collectively. As soon as we figure out the AC in this room. I'm like, yesterday I was sweating so much. I had that poor girl sitting next to me. And I, I came back after class and I was like, oh my gosh. I was like 
sweating up. I was like damp during the talk. Yeah. It's all the heat that's coming down. So, all right, so let's sign up. So we understood. I'm not gonna have any anxiety meltdowns. Good. So, um, so let's get an email address in there. So uh, maybe try out a personal email. And uh, let's, okay, so they just sent me a code. Email verification. <clears throat> I've created it. My setup is going to be a little bit different from you because you know I've had various. Amazon accounts since 2009, 2008. And it usually takes you on a couple twists and turns. I wonder if I can sign in to my old account. So you need to kind of grab Maybe I can use my Cal Poly email. I might be able to use my old account. Let me see. I don't mind using the old account, that's fine. I uh, so I think I just want to try to create a new. Why don't we try to create a new? And so, um, hey, is he making a picture? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'll just start over here. Your sign up would be quite easy. Would you be or you still Yeah, we just Oh, so okay. But what if I already use my CPP and then I'll shoot um that to my CPP? That's fine. Yeah. Great. Okay. So the idea of being a root user means that you are the user that has all the freedom. You, there's no limits put upon what you can create if you want to create a database, if you want to create an email server, whatever you want, you can make it. That's what a root user uh, does. And let's go ahead and save that. Great. Now, this is not that important. Like, personal or business, either one. Who should we contact about this account? Um, that's me. That's where I live. I am in that agreement. And at this point, um, I'm going to pause the video when I put in this information. <laughs> 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 
But let me say this. Uh, the idea here is that um, you're not going to be charged. Uh, with what I'm going to have you do this term, the assignments will not cause you to be charged. You will not incur fees by doing my course. But they must confirm that you are eligible to have an account. For example, people in Yemen cannot get an account. People in Libya cannot get an account. People who might be on a, a watch list cannot get an account. There's all sorts of identity checks that happen when you submit your uh, debit card. So, for example, um, yeah, go ahead. Um, so we need a personal account of it. Uh, personal is fine. Yep. Um, now, always in the past, students have kind of paused because some students, you know, they they may not have a debit card with them, yeah, or they may have some misgivings about using it, or they may be sharing a debit card with their family members. And so, what I would say is, take your time. I'd like to have you get an account before class next week because I'd like to have you start to do stuff in class next week. Everybody is different. Um, you may be a foreign student and somebody at home in another country may be financing things. Everybody has a different discussion to make. But um, what you'll be doing in this class will not create charges for you. Now, and here I'm telling you a story. Um, in the past, I've had very advanced students get their first AWS account and they like to wander around turning things on and that may incur expenses. You know, and th this only if you're a really experienced person might you get into trouble. Like I started to use a machine learning uh, process inside of Amazon recently, and I think it racked up like 200 bucks a day. Yeah. And so I was kind of like, how do I turn it off? Like, I just want to turn it on. And I really needed to learn my way around the system. Yeah. No, it had, it had to be a very effective system. But I'm not going to have you guys use that. Does that make sense? Like just the simplest process is 200 bucks. And it's literally that value. Um, frankly, for a corporation, that's really just chips and sauce in there. Like that's not a lot. Mm -hmm. sushi. Um, but you know, if you need to take a little time to dialogue, here's what you need to know. You're not going to be charged anything for doing my assignments. Now, if you go off the reservation and you start trying to make a Bitcoin mining operation, <laughs> you know, there, there, there will be charges because you know, what you guys are probably going to do falls under the auspice of what's called the free tier. Can you guys say free tier? Free tier. The free tier is meant for students. It's meant for people using it for the first time. Um, Amazon has become the center of the IT world. It is the number one brand in information technology based upon the AWS system. So it's fascinating for me to see where it's come from. You know, I began using it around 2009 as an infrastructure solution. It's exactly what I was looking for. The startup world it has been about AWS now for a long time. Um, but uh, you know, I think that being said, um, you know, you guys have a fairly risk-free opportunity right here. So, so yeah. All right, let me just disconnect and let me get this entered and then I'll pause the video and then hopefully I'll have my account in. Mind if it goes dark? Oh my gosh. That's just a lot of darkness. Yep. Yeah. I don't want to hear about that. I know kids are using that though. I didn't know that.
So I, I entered in my payment card, and let's go ahead and um, confirm. Here, let's see, mobile phone number, <coughs> and let's do a quick uh, check there. I had a student telling me about <laughs> how to get a fake credit card, <laughs> and I didn't know that, but I imagine you guys know all about that. It's not me. Temporary card. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's not like it. It's legitimate. It's connected. Yeah, it connects to your bank. You can set it. Literally, you don't go over it. Well, that sounds like a good uh, a good system. Um, there's not going to be any support. You're not going to need any support, so don't pay for support. Or just go basic support, which is zero. Okay. Now you are signed up. So something good to do would be to just kind of write down your basics. Um, you may go a few days without using it. But I appreciate you playing along. Now, I have been showing people AWS since I arrived here at Cal Poly. Um, I think I'm celebrating my 10th anniversary in April. And so at the time, nobody had heard of AWS. Uh, we certainly weren't teaching AWS. There was no word on the street that it was important or, or relevant. And I would have teachers come in and review it, and they would have no familiarity. Now, AWS is the, the, the primary you know, uh, knowledge body that we teach our undergrads, and more so than any other IT system. So it's really um, taken over. Um, but I remember when I first arrived, kids were really quite uncomfortable surrendering a debit card. I mean, wouldn't that be a legitimate concern? Yeah. yeah. So, okay, so I am logged in, congratulations. So my next move is to go to the management console, and I'm just gonna kind of go over there. And, you know, you're ready to go, and then it's forcing me to log in and set, you know, a, Authentication key. Hopefully, the password is saved. Good. Now, um, it's so interesting when I go online or I go on YouTube, and I notice that so many people of your age, all over the world, from all sorts of backgrounds, are learning. AWS. And I think for many young people, this will be their first education learning about cloud. They'll be cloud native. They'll be cloud for the first time that they learn IT skills. For people like myself, you know, um, there are many other infrastructure types that you know, we have experienced. And AWS was yet, yet another uh, infrastructure that we learned. But your gen, your generation, you guys are cloud native, which is really exciting. I really, I really, I think that's great. Um, here's the Amazon machine learning, maybe steer clear there. Um, you'll notice that you have the ability to make a cloud um, in many, many different data centers all over the world. And so there's a Brazil account, all sorts of European accounts, Canada, many, many Asia accounts, and then we have the four big ones in America. These are going to be the ones that you're going to be uh, using the most. Oregon, Ohio, North Virginia are cheap, cheap, cheap. They're super cheap. Florida, Northern California, it's, I think, four times the cost because that's Silicon Valley. That's for startups that need to be right in Silicon Valley. Frankly, it's silly to make things in the North California cloud. But you know who the big client of Amazon Web Services is in Northern California? 
and, uh, Apple. Apple Siri would run through AWS before Apple created their own cloud. Very interesting. I don't know if Siri is still on AWS right now. I imagine they've migrated. But Apple needed tremendous uh, computational power in order to train uh, Siri and give it plenty of data. So pretty cool. Some of the first, some of the original clients that really got AWS off the ground were A, the CIA. Uh, the CIA don't actively use the same cloud that you guys are. They actually wanted Amazon to create the, their own version of AWS on premises. What's interesting is that the, the uh, North Virginia AWS is, I think, just up the street from NSA and CIA, just in that Boston, North Virginia uh, federal government corridor. There's a lot of a lot of things happening there. Um, so when you're doing something at Amazon, just be cognizant that, like for example, I'm using Amazon in Ohio right now, and if I want to go over to Oregon, you know, lots of vampires, you know, the coast slamming up against the rocks, you know, very pale kids, you know, making out <laughs> in very poorly lit homes, lots of rain. That's Oregon. So now I'm in Oregon. And um, then I can go to Ohio. I was just there, Ohio, you know, lots of football, lots of herd of egos. Um, <coughs> North Virginia, lots of uh, government types, lots of Fed types. Very wealthy border. So, um, as you guys add new services, um, you will scale up and you'll see them here. EC2 is important. Um, EC2 is where we create servers for you guys to host an operating system that can listen to traffic. So you guys are either using Mac OS or Windows. Neither of those are major server operating systems. However, if you guys wanted to connect your laptop to the internet and then start a website on it, it would be fine. It wouldn't be very fast, but it would it, it could do it. Does that make sense? As long as you had a, a DNS environment, like for example, if you use what's called a dynamic DNS, you guys could create a, a publicly hosted service just on your web, on your laptop. And that goes against that goes against the spirit of the laptop. The laptop is really there so you can walk around and have very temporary computing services. The cloud is a bit different. So if we go into our instances, there's nothing running here at the time. But really, the vast majority of the services you can run here are going to be Linux. Can you guys say Linux? Yes. Yeah. Linux is really a commodity operating system. It's very cheap to obtain. It might be free in many cases. It's really built by graduate students and other hardcore programmers around the world. I think daily, the Linux kernel is compiled at Google. I think the, the kernel maintainers are at Google right now, as are many computer science luminaries. Um, last time I checked. Um, and you know, it's kind of a rite of passage for computer science people at the master's level in the Berkeley's and Stanford's to build new components of the Linux kernel and become a part of that persistent community. That is different from Mac OS and Windows OS, which are not open source. It's that none of the neither of those companies are inviting you guys to download Mac OS uh, today. Um, last time I checked, um, those come bundled with hardware, so it functionalizes laptops and PCs. However, the servers that you guys can be making are going to be quite different. And so, if you guys want to muck about a little bit, and you look at all the services, there's so much going on here. Um, <clears throat> the service that I'm going to have you guys using uh, from now until the end of the term is a service called Cloud9. Cloud9 is what's called an IDE, or an Integrated Development Environment. Can you guys say Integrated Development Environment? Integrated Development Environment. Um, and I'm going to let you go in just a moment, but an Integrated Development Environment is where you will write code and you'll observe its uh, results. And so what's cool about Cloud9 is that the minute that you run code in Cloud9, you're running code against the cloud. So it has the ability to deploy into a public service 
um, immediately. So you guys are kind of using the internet to stage your computations, to stage your data set. It's very interesting. So, very good. All right, gotta go. Thank you.